Hello. I'm glad to see you again and welcome to my lecture on Avionic Engineering Four. Today we will be continuing our lecture. It's topic computer aided optical design. And I want to say that today's lecture deals with two recent developments in HUD and HMD displays technology, which will have a major influence on future HUD and HMD performance, but generally speaking, not only performance, on size, weight, reliability, and both initial cost and cost of ownership. The vast majority of HUDs currently in service worldwide use a CRT as a display source. The CRT-based HUDs will remain in service for many years to come. The continuing development, however, of projected display system has now enabled a competitive, higher reliability replacement of the HUD display source to be produced. New HUD systems exploiting these developments are now entering service and the CRT-based HUD will be eventually super speedy. Uh, it is also possible to update existing CRT-based HUDs with, in effect, a new lamps for all replacement of the CRT together with updated electronics. It is appropriate at this uh, point to review the silent characteristics of the HUD CRT in order to appreciate why it has been such a hard act to follow. The CRT is basically a very simple and technically elegant device, which has truly been one of the greatest enabling enabling invention of the 20th century. Its main limitations are its reliability, around 2,000 hours MTBF, which impacts adversely on life course, cycle course in civil airline operation. The RT failure modes are generally benign and catastrophic failures are rare, so that a planned replacement is possible. And this is very nice. I agree with you. Okay. Aging is a slow process associated with the cathode degradation and phosphor burning. In practice, the highly stressed high voltage supply has been the usual cause of failure. The resolution of IR and clear sensors has also now overtaken the possible with a CRT as the luminance required. The CRT, however, has major advantages, which have been hard to match, such as sharp, crisp, cursive display symbology, and the very wide viewing angle inherent with an emissive display, an extremely high display integrity. The probability of the CRT itself displaying misleading information is less than one part in a billion per hour. The CRT provides image drawing and the light source in one package. It can operate in a cursive, 
raster of weeks, month, given queries, images in all of these modes, free from dynamics artifacts such as aliasing and speckle, which can occur with other display sources. It can also provide a stable and controllable luminance over the range from order six and up to 12,000 feet lumbers. The CRT phosphor color can be easily optimized to the peak eye response, normalized to 555 nanometer, where the PI and P43 and even P43 phosphor are highly efficient. The CRT count is basically handmade, <clears throat> and only a very high volume program can justify any automation. With the result, the count variations have to be corrected. There are few engineers around now, however, who understand analog deflection and video sequence. The idea of solution would be to produce a laser equivalent to the CRT and scan the laser beam like the electron beam in a CRT. In a further dissimilar dismal of CRT, it is also possible to scan a phosphor screen with a laser beam to give the desired color. It cannot prove possible, however, to meet the required scanning speeds today. The current solution to replace in the CRT is to use a projected type display with a very high luminance light source to illuminate a light modulator, such as a flat panel high resolution display device. Also, losses in the light modulation process contain the display efficiency. The HUD requirement can be met and reliability greatly increased. And this figure on this slide is a block diagram of a projected display unit for a HUD. A high luminance light source is used to illuminate a flat panel display device comprising a matrix addressable XY array of electrically switchable light reflecting mirror film. The display image so created is then projected onto the display screen and related by the HUD optics to the HUD compiler. The luminance of the light source is controllable over a very wide dynamic range to meet all ambient light conditions from very bright sunlight to night operation. The only viable light source until recently was a laser and production HUD using a laser light source are now entering service. This offer a five to tenfold increase in HUD reliability with MTBR in access of 20,000 hours with maturity. However, high luminance LED, which means the HUD luminance requirement, have also become available fairly recently. LED-based HUDs are being actively developed by a number of HUD manufacturers. High luminance LED costs less than equivalent high luminance laser, and they can be switched at high speed, enable a very wide range of luminance level to be readily achieved by controlling the mark space ratio of the switching frequency. The laser source illuminating level can also be controlled over the required dynamic range, but requires more complicated control electronics. LEDs are a non-coherent light source, and so do not produce speckle on the display. Lasers, being a coherent light source, can produce a destructive speckle on the display, 
and special techniques are incorporated in the HUD design to minimize speckle. The flat panel, oops, sorry, the flat panel display device can be a high resolution reflective type LCD. These are widely used in commercial and certainly in military display applications and are of modest cost because of uh, the very large sales volume. The reflection efficiency of reflecting type LCDs, however, is only about 15% and requires a high luminance light source to meet the required display brightness level. Transmissive type LCDs are unsuitable and their transmission efficiency is too low. An alternative display device to the reflective LCD in a projected display system is the Texas Instrument Digital Micro Mirror Device, or DMDTF. These devices are available in high-resolution XY arrays. For example, the Texas Instrument XSXGA1440 times 1050 DM DTM device and has over one and a half million micro mirror in a four times three aspect ratio package. They have higher reflectivity, it means uh, over 50%, and have demonstrated very high reliability in a wide variety of civil and military display applications. They are also widely used in a very large screen projection system to display high definition video. The Texas Instrument DMDTM is basically an array of over a million inch micro mirror, which can be individually deflected mechanically through near 12%. Light modulation in a dark field projection system is achieved by tilting the micro mirror to reflect light from the illuminating source tool or away from the display screen. The micro mirror's are matrix address and deflected by the electrostatic forces created by applying a voltage to the appropriate mirror electrode. Each micro mirror produces a display pixel. Okay? The micromirrors are very small indeed, around 10 microns square. It means one micron in a thousands of millimeter. The small size can be appreciated by the fact that the tip of the mirror moves through just two microns in rotating 20 degrees. The micromirror can be switched at several kilohertz. Space constraints limit further discussion of these devices, and references are given in, in the end of the lecture in further reading. This figure illustrates a projective display unit for a HUD, which BAE systems refer to as the Digital Light Engine, GLE. The insert illustration shows the Texas Instruments DM-DTM used in the DLE. Protective features are incorporated into the DLE design to ensure eye safety. Worst case scenarios of a remote probability category gives a laser energy to the pilot's eye around 200 times less than the maximum permitted explore. The BAE system, Digital Light Engine, GLE has excellent resolution over twice that of a CRT and meets all the HUD ambient light required. The laser has the potential of giving the most intense illumination, such that a daylight readable, readable, readable raster HUD is possible. Most importantly, it offers a major increase in MTDF over the CRT-based HUD. The DLE 
is a close for fit and function replacement for the CRT. This allows the chassis and optics to be retained when an HUD is upgraded. The optics never fail, and this is very nice. Okay? The probability of displaying misleading information must be less than one part in a billion per hour, where the HUD is designated a primarily flight instrument. Pixel-based displays, however, have an inherent problem in meeting these extremely high display integrity requirements. Typical concern, for example, is that a figure uh, may, a, may be regretted to read as figure, suppose three or six, by the loss of a vertical row of a pixel. Also, this has a low probability of occurrence and not be noticed. It is still too high to meet the required integrity. Different approaches to address this problem include detailed examination and monitoring of the drive signal and the camera to monitor the display. The camera system is one way of monitoring what is actually displayed in terms of both symbol form and positional placement. Signal from the camera is compared to the origin data generated. The data generated. A novel technique has been developed by BAA System Rochester at the UK to produce a full tolerant display. This patent approach uses the display device to create an active computer generated hologram, CGA, of the display image which is then illuminated by a solid-state laser to recreate that image on the diffuser screen. And this figure is a block diagram of the display generation process. The method incurs a large computational overhead as it involves carrying out a two-dimensional Fourier transform of the display image at high iteration rate. This would have been impractical a few years ago, but it is not problem with the microprocessors now available. The CGH to produce a display image is created from the phase information of the spatial harmonic components derived from the Fourier transform computation. Because the phase hologram is used, a very considerable number of individual pixel failures can be tolerated before the display image becomes significantly degraded. The display process is also more efficient and requires less power from the lens. The preceding sections have covered the basic principles, functions, and design of HUDs and HMDs which are currently in service and which will remain in service for many years to come. A recent development in holographic waveguide technology, however, will have a profound impact on future HMD and HUD design. Exploitation of this technology offers a major improvement in terms of mass, force, volume, simplicity, and optical performance. The fundamental requirement for any HMD or HUD optical system is to convey a climatic image of the display symbology into the pilot's field of view so that it overlays the distance outside work scene as illustrated in this slide. The advantages of new technology Office can best be seen by reviewing the optical requirements for any HMD or HUD system and the limitations imposed by using current optical technology. The technology to implement the current HMDs and HUDs requires relatively bulky and heavy, complex, and expensive optical systems 
because of the number of elements required to correct the system distortion. Holographic optical element, HOE, can be used to provide correction, but with adverse costs and wide penalties. This figure illustrates a typical HMG optical configuration. The illustration could also represent an HUD optical system with some rep repositioning of the optical element. The relative complexity of the optical system can be seen. The mask is also well covered of the pilot's head C O G. Space and weight constraint several times uh, severely limit the diameter of the relay lens aperture, which in turn determines the size of the exit pupil. Particularly large lenses will be very expensive if they are not to suffer from aberration. They are also size limited by the severe thermal and vibration stresses experienced in military aircraft. HMD and HUD systems exploiting holographic waveguide technology have been actively developed by FIRE system, Rochester in CAP. FIRE systems refer to the new technology HMD as the Q side, HMD. The new HUD as the QHUD. The Q is derived from a quantum, from the exploitation of quantum mechanics physics and the quantum leap in performance that the technology can provide. This figure illustrates the basic concept of using a simple holographic waveguide to convey a collimated display image directly into the pilot's field of view. The systems explore some of the original work in optical waveguide technology carried by the Professor Bill Crossland and Dr. Adrian Travis in the Cambridge University Engineering Department. And this figure is a schematic illustration of a two-side HMD showing the basic element. A brief explanation of the operating principles involved is set out below. Space constraint and company confidential confidentiality limit the depth of the power. It is also assumed that the re that uh, our student will have some basic knowledge of optics. And where this is not the case, will accept certain basic principles and parts. The optical wave chi comprises a sandwich of two thin rectangular glass plates with a holographically generated diffraction grating in the middle of the sandwich. The display image is first optically collimated with a simple lens system and then launched into the waveguide by an optical prism arrangement. The optical elements are small and relatively low cost. The lenses are on axis and can be of optical quality plastic. The light rays from the collimated display image are then internally reflected along the waveguide as shown in this figure. When a reflected light ray encounters the diffraction grating, a very small fraction of the light is diffracted out as shown. The diffracted light from the grating forms a continuous row of images of the display exit pupil, which is duplicated along the horizontal waveguide. The second waveguide which for the combiner is optically coupled at right angles of the first waveguide. The row of exit pupils from the first waveguide is then coupled into the second waveguide as so as to form an array of rows and columns of exit pupils along the waveguide combiner, as shown in this slide. The function of this second waveguide is to couple the exit pupil to the eye. The image 
is adjected normal to the glass and overlay on the outside wall. Because the display image we see in an exit tubal is collimated, that is focused at infinity, infinity. It does not matter if the pilot can see a particular symbol in two overlapping exit tubal. That symbol will still overlay the same point on the distance outside the board thing. And this slide illustrates this fundamental principle. And the next figure in this slide is a photograph of a Q-side HMD. The basic simplicity of the HMD can be readily seen. It is intrinsically inexpensive to manufacture and a modular approach enables it to be incorporated onto existing pilot helmet as a bolt-on attachment. The simplicity of the side Low mass and the large eye position box make it an attractive solution. Symbology and or video can be displayed providing full CAD app operation. It is also fully compatible with night vision Googles and BGs without modification or reconfiguration. This is a major advantage, particularly for helicopter applications. The side is mounted on its oven mount and positioned at approximately 25 mm from the eye. The holographic waveguide combiner is roughly credit card size and about 2.5 mm or 0.1 inch thick. The inset photo has been taken looking through the combiner and shows display symbology overlaying the outside the elimination of the bulky and complex optical projection system required in a conventional HUD by the use of a holographic waveguide to inject the display directly into the pilot's field of view offers major advantages. The advantages of large weight, smaller size, large head position box, and intrinsically lower cost which were first exploded in the Q-side, apply equally to the HUD. PAA system is accordingly developing a QHUD. The QHUD holographic waveguide system is basically a larger version of that used in the Q-side and is shown schematically in this slide. Don't worry about this, uh, maybe, a bit complicated from first point of view, but generally it's very nice. Okay, the display image source is a high resolution reflective type LCD illuminated by a solid state laser. This enables a much smaller and lighter HUD, easier to fit in the aircraft, and with a better all around performance. Intrinsically lower cost and increased reliability. And this figure is a photograph of a prototype QHUD installed in a business jet. The prototype QHUD is 50% smaller and lighter than conventional civil HUD and has an eye position box many times greater than current HUD which are limited by the relay lens diameter. The field of view is 34 degrees sorry, horizontally and by 25 degrees vertically. And the combined transmission is over 80%. As mentioned in the introduction to this lecture, the pilot and the crew must be able to control the information being displayed. For example, to switch modes and information sources at the various phases of the mission. Or in the event of malfunction, failure, emergency, threat, etc. It is also essential for the pilot to be able to enter data into the various avionic systems, like navigation waypoints. 
so control and data entry are thus complementary to the various display and enable the pilot and the crew to interact with the various avionic systems in the aircraft. The means for effecting control and data entry must be as easy as natural as possible, particularly on the high board load condition. And this part of our lecture gives will give a brief overview of tactile control panel, direct voice input, and eye trackers as a means of control and data entry. Okay, so let's continue. This have already been briefly described earlier, as you remember. I hope a typical tactile control panel uses a matrix array of infrared beams across the surface of the display, which displays the various functions key, touching a specific function key on the display surface interrupt the X and Y infrared red beam, which intersect over the displayed key function and hence signal the operation of that particular key function. This slide illustrates the basic principle. Okay, so let's go on. Direct voice input DVI control is a system which enables the pilot to enter data and control the operation of the aircraft avionic systems by means of speech. The spoken commands and data are recognized by a speech recognition system which compares the spoken utterances with the stored speech templates of the system vocabulary. The recognized commands or data are then transmitted to the aircraft subsystem by means of an interconnecting data bus, MIL STD 1553 data bus. As examples, to change a communication channel frequency, the pilot simply says radio followed by select frequency three for five decimal six. Or to enter navigation data, the pilot says navigation followed by enter waypoint latitude 51 degree, 31 minutes, 11 seconds, north. Longitude zero degrees, 45 minus 17 seconds best. Feedback that the DVI system has recognized the pilot's command correctly is provided visually on the HUD and HMD if installed. And orally by means of a speech synthesizer code system. The pilot then confirms the correctly recognized command by saying enter and the action is initiated. The pilot can thus stay head up and does not have to divert attention from the higher outside board in order to operate touch panel, switches, push button, keyboards, and many, many others. DVR, I hope you remember this abbreviation, right? Okay, that's very nice. Can DVI can thus reduce the pilot's workload in high workload situation? It should be uh, it should be uh, noted that the vocabulary required is not extensive and pilots and crew may go DBI some. This is because they are trained to speak clearly and consciously in a strongly structured way when giving commands and information over the communication channel to fellow crew members are the aircraft and ground control. The main characteristics and requirements for an airborne DVI system are briefly summarized as fully connected speech. In this case, the speech recognition system must be able to recognize normal fully connected speech with no pauses required between words. 
systems, which require a pause between each word, are known as isolated word recognition and must be able to operate in the cockpit noise environment. The background noise level can be very high in a fast jet combat aircraft. Of vocabulary size, the require, required vocabulary is around 200 up to 300 words. For speech template duration, the maximum speech template duration is about five seconds. For vocabulary duration, because the maximum duration of the total vocabulary is around 160 seconds. For syntax notes, the maximum number of the syntax uh, notes required is about 300. An example of a typical syntax tree is shown in this slide. Or maybe duration of a term. There must be no restriction on the maximum duration of an input term. Or recognition response time, because these must be in a real time. Only a very brief outline of speech recognition systems can be given because of space constraints. The basic principle are to extract the key speech features of the spoken utterance and then to match these features with the stored vocabulary template. Sophisticated algorithms are used to select the best match and to output the recognized words if the confidence level is sufficiently high. And this slide illustrates the speech features of an individual word which can be extracted by special analysis of the spoken utterance. The distinctive features can be seen in the 3D spectrogram. Very extensive research and development has been carried out and is continuing activity worldwide to produce speech recognition systems which are speaker independent. That is, they will recognize words spoken clearly by any speaker. And this is very nice. Various recognition algorithms are used, including Markov pattern matching and neural net techniques. Commercial systems with an impressive performance are now widely available. For example, automated telephone inquiry and data entry system. Although these systems only require a limited vocabulary, the accurate recognition of string of number is a good test for any speech recognition system. The airborne environment, however, poses particular requirements, such as the ability to operate to a very high confidence level in a high background noise situation. Noise situation. A recognition accuracy of at least 96% is required in the cockpit environment to minimize having a repeat, a common, and this would defeat the objective of a easing pilot workload. The speech recognition system must also recognize common spoken during the physical stress of maneuvering. For this reason, the stored vocabulary templates are currently derived directly from the pilot to characterize the system to his particular speech pattern. As already mentioned, the stored vocabulary requirements are not extensive, only about two or three hundred words. IKBS technology can also be used to improve the recognition accuracy by deducing the context in which the words are spoken and ruling out words which are out of context or unlikely. In the case of numerical data, numbers which are outside the likely range for that quantity, for example, radio frequencies or latitude or longitude coordinates can be rejected. 
knowledge of the context is essential when we carry out intelligent conversation in a noisy environment where not every word can be heard clearly. For instance, at a party where there are many conversations taking place at the same time. Audio warning systems using speech synthesizer, synthesizer, uh, synthesizers to provide voiced warning messages to the pilot or crew of system malfunctions and danger or threat are now well established. They are also complementary to a DVI system to provide the essential feedback that a spoken command or data input has been correctly recognized. Development of digitally generated speech synthesizers has been taking place over many years, and high performance systems are now available and in wide scale using many everyday applications, apart from aircraft. A very interesting recent development for combat aircraft applications is the use of stereo sound warning signal to indicate the direction of the thread to the pilot, like behind and to the left or right, above or below, etc. Trials in advanced cockpit simulators with fast jet pilots from front line squadron have produced favorable and positive responses. And it is considered that stereo warning systems are likely nearest future development. The integration and management of all the display surfaces by audio inputs enables a very significant reduction in the pilot's workload to be achieved in the new generation of single seat fighter or strike aircraft. And this slide illustrates the basic concept of an audio or tactile management system. Such a system is installed in the Eurofighter Typhoon, and the effectiveness of the system is reducing pilot workload when combined with the carefree maneuvering resulting from the FBW flight control system. And the automatic engine control system is referred to as voice throttle stick control. Eye tracking systems, I beam fairly widely used and evaluated in ground simulators for such future applications as improved target designation accuracy by enable a more accurate measurement of the pilot case angle to be made in conjunction with a head tracker system. Data entry is in conjunction with a helmet mounted display can also be achieved. A keyboard can be displayed on the HMD and data can be entered by looking at the appropriate data symbol like function switch and digits of from the zero to nine and many, many others. And then operating a simple push button. The pilot's case angle is measured by the eye tracker and displayed by a simple cross on the HMD. The pilot can thus see his LOS light of sight is on the chosen symbol. A fast and accurate data entry system can be achieved by this means. Prototype helmet mounted eye trackers have been built which explore the principle of corneal reflex. These have demonstrated half degrees accuracy at a 15 hertz iteration rate. It appears, however, that current helmet mounted typing system and also current data entry systems are adequate. There does not appear to be a requirement for an eye tracking system at the moment, which would justify the increased helmet mounted mass and core. Next part of today's lecture, it's called fly-by-wire flight control. 
the introduction on fly by wire F by B W flight control systems has been a water shell development in aircraft evolution, as it has enabled technical advances to be made, which we were not possible before. One of the unique benefits of flight by wire FDW system is the ability to explore aircraft configurations which provide increased aerodynamic efficiency, like more relief and lower drag, but at a cost of reduced natural stability. This can include negative stability, that is, the aircraft is unstable over a part of the range of speed and high conditions, or maybe a flight envelope. The FBW system provides high integrity automatic stabilization of the aircraft to compensate for the loss of natural stability and that enables a light, lighter aircraft with a better overall performance to be produced compared with a conventional design. It also provides a pilot with very good control and handling characteristics which are more or less constant over the whole flight envelope and under all loading conditions. Other benefits of FBW system can provide the maneuver command control, carefree maneuvering, and not least the elimination of the bow and mechanical complexity of the control rod and linkages connecting the pilot stick to the control surface, PCU, and consequent weight saving. Aircraft with FBW flight control system just came into service in the late 1970s using analog implementation. Digital FBW systems from a, have been in service since the late 1980s. The concepts are not new. In fact, all guided missiles use this type of control. What has taken the time has been the development of the failure survival technologies to enable a high integrity system to be implemented economically with the required safety level, reliability, and availability. A major factor has been the development of failure survival digital flight control systems and their implementation in DLSI microcircuit. There are other technologies where development has been essential for the FBW control, such as failure survival actual system to operate the control surface. All new fighter designs explore FBW control. And this figure illustrates the Eurofighter Typhoon as a typical example. A recent development in military aircraft is the emergence of stealth technology, where the aircraft configuration and shape are specifically designed to reduce its radar cross section. In general, the stealth feature reduces the aircraft's natural stability and damp. And FBW control is essential to achieve good handling and control characteristics. The current generation of civil airliners explore FBW control. Examples are the Airbus and Boeing 777 and 787. Very many tens of millions of flying hours have now been accumulated by aircraft with digital FBW flight control systems and their safety and integrity have been established. And this slide shows the basic elements of FBW flight control system, but no, the total elimination of all the complex mechanical controls, runs, and linkages, all commands and signals are transmitted electrically along wire, and hence the name flight by wire, okay? Very simple.
the interposition of a computer between the pilot's command and the control surface actuator. The aircraft motion sensors, which, which feedback the component of the aircraft angular and linear motion to the computer. The air data sensors, which supply high and air speed information to the computer. Not shown in the figure is the redundancy to enable failures in the system to be absorbed. The flaps can also be continually controlled by the flight control computer. I, I think you agree with me. And command links and actuators omitted for clarity. The pilot does control the aircraft through the flight control computer. And the computer determines the control surface movement for the aircraft to respond in the best way to the pilot's command and achieve a fast, well-timed response throughout the flight envelope. The key features are described in more detail a bit later. Electrical transmission of signals and commands is a key element in an FPW system. Modern systems use a serial digital data transmission system with time division multiplex. The signal can then be transmitted along a network or highway comprising two wires only, as only one set of data is being transmitted at any particular time. And this slide shows how a digital flight control system is interconnected using a digital data bus. Military FBW generally use a well-established MIL STD-1553 data bus system. The links and bus use a screen twisted pair of wires with a connection to the bus through isolated transformers. This is a common or response system with the bus controller function embedded in the flight control computer. It has a data rate of 1 megabit per second and a word length of 20 bits to encode clock data and address, and so can receive or transmit up to 50,000 data words a second. The Boeing 777 uses the RE 629 data bus system. This is an autonomous system and operates at 2 megabit per second. The links and paths use an unscreened twisted pair of wires with connection to the bus through demountable current transformer couples, couplets. The electronic complexity required in these systems to code the data and transmit it or to receive data and decode it is encapsulated in one or two integrated microcircuits. Data bus systems are covered in next uh, in one of the next lectures from our avionic system integration lecture. The actuation systems, which control the movement of the control surfaces, are vital elements in FBW system. They must be able to survive any two failures and carry on operating such a satisfactorily in order to meet the aircraft safety and integrity requirements. The servo actuation systems driving the control surface comprise a two-stage servo system with the LBW servo actuators driving the tuplex control valves of the main power control actuators. Both electrohydraulic and electric those stage actuating systems are used. Also, the trend is now towards the direct drive electric motor. Linear and rotary electric mag magnetic actuators are used with multiple independent windings. Three windings in the case of a triplex system or four windings in a quadruplex system. A typical quadruplex Actuating systems comprises four totally independent door stage actuators 
which force add their output to drive the power control unit, PCU, thermal control valve. And this figure shows a quadruplex actuating system schematically with electrical first stage actuators driving the PCU servo control valve. There is no mechanical feedback from the PCU actuator to the servo control valve, as there is in a conventional non FBW system. Instead, the position of the control surface is fed back electrically to the input of the actuator control electronic. Four independent position sensors are used to maintain the required integrity. The overall feedback improves the speed of the response of the actuation system by a factor of about 10 compared with the conventional PCU. Fast response is absolutely essential in an FBW actuation system in order to minimize the lags in the FBW loop. A typical agile fighter, which is aerodynamical, I the unstable would diverge exponentially with the diver divergent doubling every over two seconds in the absence of fly-by-wire control. The response of fly-by-wire system, FBW, to correct any divergence must thus be very fast. The actuator response requirement for a modern agile fighter corresponds to a phase lock of less than 12 degrees at one turn. The failure survival philosophy of, of a quadruplex actuating system is that if one actuator fails, the three good ones can be overriding. And that is very nice and very pleasure for all passengers in modern airlines. So the failed actuator is identified by comparing its control signals with the other three on the assumption that the probability of more than one failing as precisely the same instance is extremely remote. All four actuators are totally independent in terms of separate power supply, control electronics, and more enough. The failed actuator is then disconnected or in the case of an electrohydraulic first stage actuator, is hydraulically bypassed, leaving three good actuators in common. A second subsequent actuator failure is detected by a similar process. Two actuators are in agreement, one deeper, therefore it must be the failed one. The second failed actuator is then disconnected or bypassed, leaving the remaining two good actuators in control. In the extremely unlikely event of a subsequent sort failure, the control surface would remain in the position at the time of failure this one good actuator opposing the failed one. In the case of a triplet architecture, some form of inline fault detection is required to survive a second failure. For example, comparison with a computer model of actuator. And this slide illustrates the key features of flight by wire in simple diagramming form. The ABW system has to have motion sensor feedback by definition. Without these sensors, the system is classified as a direct electric link system. The motion sensors comprise rate gyros, which measure the angular rate of rotation of the aircraft about its pitch, roll, and gear axis. And linear accelerometers, which measure the components of the aircraft acceleration along these axis, along the pitch, roll, and yaw. The feedback action of this sensor in automatically stabilizing the aircraft can be seen from this slide. Any change in the motion of the aircraft resulting from a disturbance of any sort, like gas, is immediately sensed 
by the motion sensors and causes the computer to move the appropriate control surfaces so as to apply forces and moments to the aircraft to correct and suppress the deviation from the commanded flight path. On automatic hands-off stability is achieved with the aircraft rock steady if the pilot lets go of the control stick. The motion sensors also enable a maneuver command control to be exercised by the pilot, as will be explained a bit later. Because of their vital role and the need to be able to survive failure, they are typically at a quadruplex level of redundancy. The need for air data information on the airspeed and high is to compensate for the very wide variation in the control circuit effectiveness over the aircraft flight envelope or high and speed combination. For example, low speed at low altitude during takeoff and landing, high speed appro approaching Mach 1 at low altitude in the case of a military strike aircraft or cruising subsonic flight at high altitude where the air is very thin or supersonic flight at medium to high altitude, etc. The variation in control surface effectiveness or stick force per G, as it is referred to, can be as high as 40 to 1. For example, at 45,000 feet, it may require 20 degrees of tailplane deflection to produce a normal acceleration only a 1G. At very high subsonic speeds of around 600 kilonauts at very low altitude, however, it may only need half degree deflection and 20 degree would produce sufficient G to break up the aircraft. It is thus necessary to adjust or scale the control surfaces deflection according to the aircraft airspeed and high as it is not possible to achieve a stable cross-loop control system with such a wide variation in the open loop game. The aircraft response and controllability are also depend dependent on its Mach number. That is the ratio of the true airspeed of the aircraft to the local speed of sound. The flight by fire system is thus supplied with airspeed high and Mach number in order to adjust or scale the control surface deflection accordingly. And this process is referred to as air data gain scheduling in the USA. Totally independent redundant sources of air data information are required in order to meet the safety and integrity requirements. And generally, quadruplex source are used. The FBW system also requires information on the aircraft incidence angles, that is, the local flow angle in the pitch and your plane between the airstream and the fuselage data. The pitch incidence angle controls the beam lift, and it is essential to monitor that the incidence angle is below the maximum value to ensure that a stall condition is not reached. A stall results when the air flow starts to break away from the upper surface of the wheel, with consequent sudden loss of lift and control. The incidence angle in the pitch plane, or angle of attack, as it is often called, is used as a control term in pitch fly by wire system. The incidence angle in the yaw plane is known as the angle of side slip and is used as a control term in the FBW radar control system. This figure illustrates an integrated air data sensor unit which combines the incidence vane and the pitot-static probe. The vane aligns itself with the airstream in the same manner as a weather wave. The unit contains the total pressure and static pressure sensor 
together with the associated electronics, including a microprocessor, to carry out the air data comp computation. It provides high calibration airspeed, Mach number, and local flow angle information to the flight by wire system. For this air data transducer system, as they are known, are installed on the Eurofighter Typhoon to meet the failure survival and integrity requirements. The flight control computing system must be of very high integrity and have the failure survival capability to meet the flight safety requirements. The tasks carried out by computing system comprise failure detection, false isolation, and system reconfiguration in the event of a failure. Computation of the required control surface angle, monitoring, and build in effect. The overall system integrity must be as high as the mechanical control system it replaces. The probability of a catastrophic failure must not exceed 10 or even 9 hours for a civil aircraft and from 10 up to 7 hours for a military aircraft. Another subtopics today lecture is advantages of flight by wire control. The main advantages of well-designed FBW flight control system are flight by wire enables a smaller tail plan, beam and rudder to be used thereby reducing both aircraft weight and draft. Active control of the tape plan and rudder making up for the reduction of nature of stability. For a civil airliner, reducing the stability margins and compensating for the reduction with a fly-by-wire system and thus results in a lighter aircraft with a better performance and better operating economics and flexibility than a conventional design, for example, the ability to carry additional freight. Conventional airlines may have the space for additional freight containers, but the resulting reward shift to the central gravity would give the aircraft an unacceptably marked handling characteristics. It should be noted that the carriage of containerized freight, as well as passengers, for a very significant part of an airliner's revenue. A civil flight-by-wire airline can be configured so that its control and handling characteristics are very similar to those of comparable mechanically signaled aircraft. And this is considerable advantage in civil airline operations, where pilots may be interchanging with existing mechanically signaled aircraft in the airline fleet. The Boeing 777 incorporates this philosophy. For a military aircraft, such as an air super superiority fighter, the FYW system enables aircraft configurations with negative stability to be used. And this gives more lift as the trim lift is possible, and so that the lighter, more agile fighter can be produced. Agile agility being codified as the ability to change the direction of aircraft's velocity vector. An increase in instantaneous turn rate of 35 degrees is claimed for some of the new agile fighters. It should be noted that the aerodynamic center moves up at supersonic speeds, increasingly the longitudinal stability. In fact, most agile fighters, which are longitudinally unstable at subsonic speed, become stable at supersonic speed. In the case of a conventional aircraft, the increase in longitudinal stability at supersonic speed requires larger pitch control moments. A highly stable aircraft resists changing its incidence, whereas maneuverability requires rapid changes in incidence. Electrically signaled controls are lighter than mechanically signaled controls. 
applied by wire eliminate the bulk and mechanical complexity of mechanically signal control. But with their disadvantages of friction, buckler, no matter mechanical lost motion or so, structure flexure problems, periodic rigging, and adjustment. The control gearing are also implemented through software, which gives greater flexibility. Flight by wire, flight control enables a small compact pilot's control stick to be used, allowing more flexibility in the cockpit layout. The displays are obs obscured by a large control column. The cockpit flight there is very valuable real estate. The FBW control stick is often referred to as fly-by-wire interceptor. A FBW interceptor is defined as a device which translates the pilot's control inputs into electrical signals. They can be divided into two basic types, passive and active. The passive type of fly-by-wire interceptor provides a fixed stick for stick displacement relationship by means of mechanical spring box array. And the active type of interceptor, it contrast can provide a wide range of stick for stick displace displacement characteristics by computer control of force model, which back drive the control stick. Active interceptors are a subject in their own right and are maintaining the balance of this part of our leg. And this slide illustrates the features of a passive plate flight by wire interceptor. The illustration shows a centrally mounted control stick is installed in the Euro Fighter Typhoon on the right side. And the side mounted stick on the left is the Lockheed F 22 Raptor Fighter. The diagram shows the construction schematically. The stick is a two axis one and provides speech and roll electrical command signal. Typically, four independent electrical positions, peak offs are provided for each axis of control. The damper is an essential element. Without it, the stick would be considerably underdone because of their low friction in the mechanism. And the significant mass of the hand grip, it provides a smooth spill of the stick mover. The spring mass damper combination acting as a low pass filter on the stick moment. The stick force characteristics are shown in this figure. A small breakout force is required to display the stick from the central position in pitch and row. Row control is a simple linear spring characteristic. Pitch, however, requires a step increase in force at larger stick displacement and spring rate increases so that larger forces have to be exerted when commanding high G manoeuvre. These characteristics are carefully tailored to meet the consensus of pilot approval. And these controls need to be integrated automatically to avoid an excessive pilot workload, too many things to do at once leading and trailing edge flaps for maneuvering and not just for takeoff and landing, or variable wind sweep, thrust vectoring, and the electrical interface and the maneuver command control of the flight by wire system greatly ease the autopilot integration task. The autopilot provides steering command as pitch rate or roll rate commands to the FBW system. The relatively high bandwidth maneuver command in a loop flight by wire system ensures that response to the outer loop autopilot commands is fast and well timed, ensuring good control of the aircraft flight path in the autopilot model. More story. A demanding autopilot performance 
is required for applications such as automatic landing or automatic terrain following at 100 to 200 foot above the ground at over 600 kilonauts, where the excursions from the demanded flight path must be kept small. And this was one of the drivers, in part, for the fly-by-wire system installed in the tornado strike aircraft, together with the need to maintain good handling and control when carrying a large load of external store. A closed-loop maneuver command control is achieved by increasing the gain of the motion sensor feedback loop. The control surface actuators are thus controlled by the difference or error between the pilot's command signal and the measured aircraft motion from the appropriate sensor. For example, pitch ray in the case of a pitch ray command system and roll ray in the case of a roll rate command system. Other control tabs may also be included, such as air stream inside and angle, and possibly normal and lateral acceleration. The flight control computer derives the required control surface movements for the aircraft to follow the pilot's command in a far well done manner. It should be stressed that the achievements of such a response requires extensive design and testing and well integrated combination of aircraft and FBW control system. And, and um, for instance, adequate control power must be available from the control surfaces and nonlinear behavior taken into account, like rate limiting in the actuating system. A well-designed closed-loop control system opens the following advantages over an open-loop control system. And first of all, the steady state output to input relationship is substantially independent of changes in the loop gain, which provides this remains sufficiently high. Second, the system bandwidth is improved and the plane lock, phase lock, when following a dynamically varying input is reduced. So, a fast well down response, which is little affected by normal changes in the loop gain and can generally be achieved by suitable design of the control loop. This slide is a block diagram of the closed loop roll rate common system. Consider what happens when the pilot pushes the stick to command a roll rate. At the instant the command is applied, the roll rate is zero. So that the roll rate error produces a large aileron deflection. And this creates a relatively large rolling movement of the aircraft so that the roll rate builds up rapidly. The roll rate error is rapidly reduced until the roll rate error is near the zero. And the aircraft roll rate is effectively equal to the commanded roll rate because the roll rate creates an aerodynamic dumping movement moment Sorry, which opposes the rate of roll, and the aileron deflection cannot be reduced to zero, but is reduced to a value where the rolling moment produced is equal and opposing to the aerodynamic dumping moment. The control again is sufficiently high, however, to keep the steady state roll error to a small one. A much faster roll response can be obtained compared with a conventional open loop system, as can be seen in this diagram. The variation in response across the flight envelope is also much less. Aircraft need to bend to tone so that a fast, precise roll response is required. Right? Okay. Push the stick sideways and roll rate directly proportional to the force exerted to the stick is obtained. 
return the stick to the center when the desired bank angle is reached and the aircraft stops rolling without any overshoot. And that's very nice and comfort for the pilot. And this figure shows a flight by wire pitch rate common system. Consider now what happens when the pilot exerts a force on the stick to comment a pitch rate. The aircraft pitch rate is initially zero, so that the resultant pitch rate error causes the computer to demand an appropriate deflection of the tail plane from the train position. Look at the diagram here, please. And the ensuing lift force acting on the tail plane exerts a pitching moment on the aircraft about its center of gravity. Yes, you can see on the center of gravity, causing the pitch attitude to change the beam incidence to increase. The resulting lift force from the beams provides the necessary force at the right angles of the aircraft velocity vector to change the direction of the aircraft flight path so that the aircraft turns in the pitch plane. The increasing pitch rate is fed back to the computer, reducing the tail plane and angle until a condition is reached when the aircraft pitch rate is equal to the common pitch rate. The pitch rate error is thus brought to near zero and maintained near zero by automatic control loops. Pitch rate common enables precise fingertips controlled by achieving a chipset. For example, to change the pitch attitude to climb, gently pressure back on the stick, reducing to a pitch rate of a few degrees per second. Let the stick go back to the central position and the pitch rate stops in less than a second with negligible overshoot with the aircraft at the desired attitude. Increasing the stick force produces a proportionate increase, pro, uh, sorry, proportionate increase in pitch rate. The normal acceleration, or g, is equal to the aircraft velocity multiplied by the pitch rate, so that for a given speed, the g is directly proportional to the rate of pitch, right? Okay, nice. The concept of reducing the rider cross-section of an aircraft so that it is virtually undetectable, except at very close range and has been given the name stealth in the USA. Rider reflection returns are minimized by the facetic surfaces, which reflect radar energy away from the direction of the source. Engine intake design and the extensive use of radar energy absorbing materials in the structure. An example of a stealth aircraft is the Northrop B2, shown in this slide. Sales considerations are requirements can conflict with aerodynamic requirements, and flight by wire flight control is essential to give accepted safe landing across the flight angle. At this moment, I think it's enough for today. Okay? We will be continuing next time. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. And I'm looking forward to see you next time. Bye.